Good morning. It's time for Daily Chapel at the LCMS International Center in St. Louis. The text is Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 13. The Reverend John Denzer is preaching. The broadcast of Chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. A reading from Mark, the 16th chapter. Now when Jesus arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and that had been, he had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The Revised Common Lecture with which I'm getting acquainted had as one of its priorities to expand both the appearances of Easter and the proclamations of Easter. Acts is featured all the time. Many of the sermons of Peter and Paul and the other apostles, all of which center on the vindication of Christ. And you know the way they go. You killed the Lord of life, but the Father has raised him from the dead and publicly testified that he is his Christ, this Jesus whom you killed. Well, for a few reasons, today's accounts were not added into the new lectionary, not even in this year, B on Mark. There's nothing here that you can't find in the other Gospels. Mary Magdalene there in the garden, we heard that on Easter morning early and on Thursday last week. Two disciples walking with, to Emmaus, we heard that in Luke on Monday and on Easter evening. But the refrain rings out in these texts. They did not believe. I think it's safe to say that nobody likes these resurrection stories today. Mark was bad enough already when the women ended fleeing the tomb in silent fear. If there's anything different between what we've just heard and the other Gospels, it's that the report of the Emmaus disciples doesn't immediately get met with that Easter acclamation. The Lord is risen indeed. He's appeared to Simon. Doubt and unbelief can persist. And they do. Even if we stopped at verse 8, the traditional gospel reading for Easter Sunday itself, doubt and unbelief persist in that telling of Christ's resurrection. Doubt and unbelief persisted in Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons of doubt and unbelief had already been cast out before this. Well, what does Jesus say? Not only seven, but seven times seven. Not only on Easter, but also on Quasimodo, and also on every Sunday yet to come, it must happen. Not only in the Word, but also in the breaking of the bread must He be made known to us. Not only in the wounds, but also in the Word. Your sins are forgiven. Not only once in the word peace, but again I say to you, peace be with you. Among the salutary reasons that we Lutherans have to honor the saints, to commemorate them, is the opportunity to view their failings and their weaknesses and to see that they were not rejected by Jesus Christ. We see how their faith was strengthened, rather. We see how the grace of God truly superabounds over sin. And to see that, we are encouraged. We are strengthened also not to give up. We're brought back today to the saying of that father, which is also from Mark, by the way. I believe, help thou my unbelief. The Lord in verse 14 today does appear to them. He does come. And when he does, he first rebukes them for their hardness of heart and for their unbelief. He did the same thing to the boys on the way to Emmaus and Luke. Doubt is not good. 
Unbelief is sin. It's not something anyone can be proud of. According to Christ in John 16, he says unbelief is kind of the root, the origin of all sin. Weaknesses in us cannot so easily be disentangled from all of the corruptions of sin that are deep within us. They're corruptions of our mind, corruptions of our bodies even, often of our wills. And all these things must be rebuked. They must be overcome. That means they must be forgiven. They too must be put to rest in the wounds of Jesus. And that happens in the forgiveness of sins. So resist the urge to make Thomas or any of these other doubters an anti-hero. We do not honor the saints for their weaknesses and their sins. But we do draw strength in seeing how Christ shows undeserved kindness, grace to them. Because indeed, he shows it to us also. Remember the end of Sunday's Gospel, the words to Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen, like all the people in today's readings, and yet who believe. These things are written that you who have not seen may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The words of the gospel of what Jesus has done for us and that indeed he is risen, they are to be as persistent among us, or more persistent as the doubts and the unbelief that persist with us as well. Because it is by these words of the gospel and of the continual forgiveness of sins that that unbelief and doubt is put away. The Spirit convicts us of our sins because in every way we do not believe in Christ. We betray the belief that we have in Him in our words and in our actions so that it seems, it seems that even when we believe, we do not believe better Christians to acknowledge that. Better that the Spirit would bring it out of us. Better even to risk that it might be written down, whether by the Spirit himself or just by someone else, so that we'd have to read it today. Better that than to pretend it away, which never works. It is the very same Spirit that then comes and convinces us of the righteousness that we have in Christ Jesus, the one who went to his Father as a sacrifice for sins, who bore sin's punishment, who by his wounds and his stripes has purchased and won us back to himself, who does not turn us or Thomas away, because indeed he is risen. It is better always to hear again, to have your doubts overcome again, to be surprised by the account again, and then to marvel at it. To marvel like those two disciples. Did not our hearts burn? Did not our hearts sting a little, even, to discover that it was Jesus who was speaking to us in his word? Jesus, who had told us it was going to happen like this, after all, three times and we struggled to believe it, it was Jesus who was opening that old Bible passage up to me again, arresting me, convicting me, even at my age, even in my position, and helping me to believe. Helping even my unbelief. That's why we follow Luther's insight and we insist that the pastor, when he is conducting private confession, has to ask at least one question of the penitent, and that's hard to do. And this is the question. Do you believe that the forgiveness that I speak is God's own forgiveness? It's more than just a clarifying question about the doctrine of the keys or the, what the minister's there for, like we heard yesterday. It's not a heroic question, but it can sometimes feel like one when you answer it. God grant that our hearts would answer heroically, just as the script reads to us, 
Yes, I believe it. Yes. Yes, let it be to me according to your word. If you should ever find that you have to answer against the script, a shameful, no, I don't, I, I don't think I do believe it. That would be better than lying to the pastor and to God. But it would also be then the pastor's privilege and his duty and his glad gladness to instruct and to teach your conscience with the gospel. Since faith comes by that kind of a hearing, hearing the word of Christ, hearing again and again what he has done. That's just what your pastor would do until the answer can be by the Spirit's power. Yes, yes and amen in Christ as all the promises of God are. Now I may be the director of such things, but I'm not really that interested in rewriting the lectionary or rewriting any gospels. I'm also not interested in rewriting our form of confession or second-guessing Martin Luther. But I wouldn't mind if the answer to the question were, I believe, help my unbelief. Because that is surely the case, always, whether we say it out loud or not. Our Lord's word, then, and his spirit, and his flesh, and his blood refresh such a Christian. And they let it be done for us as we believe, however meagerly that may be. But they don't leave us with just that only. Instead, his word comes and again and again also helps our unbelief tamps it down, drives it away, rebukes it, and replaces it with faith. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen. Thank you for joining us for Chapel. The broadcast of Chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. To learn more about long and short-term opportunities to serve, visit servenow.lcms.org.